welcome to the show. Today, we are going to go behind the scenes and figure out the true nature of government and why they're not going to save you. Uh, welcome to this fascinating exploration today. Uh, we're talking about the true nature of the state. If you enjoy this video, you just might enjoy the book by Murray Rothbard. It's called Anatomy of the State. Uh, so yeah, if you enjoy this, that, that'd be worth, worth reading that book. Uh, so first of all, let's kind of define the state. And, and so I'm going to just kind of kick it off by saying that the state is essentially a group of people who say that they are the only ones who can make rules and enforce those rules in a certain geographic area. Is this Does this make sense that somebody can do that? Well, you and I probably think that it can because that's how it's always been for us. However, that isn't the way that it was always for humanity. It's not the way that it needs to be in the future. And some people might say, well, the, the way you transport yourself from one place to another has always been across the ground. And then in the early 1900s, the Wright brothers kind of helped us realize, hey, there's this new idea that maybe there's a different, sometimes a better way to get ourselves from one place to another. So let's talk a little bit about the origins of the state. It's kind of like some people will, will try to convince you that the way that that communities or, or societies were formed is they just kind of happened to come along and then people realized they needed somebody to tell them what they needed to do. And so then those people kind of rose to the top and these benevolent, wonderful leaders led everyone else to, to prosperity and peace and, and goodness and happiness. And that's that's one story. But there's another one. Let me tell a little story and see if you can see the nuance and relate this to what might be happening in the real world today. Once upon a time, in a land of scattered tribes and varied landscapes, a band of robbers roamed freely. They traveled from place to place, pilfering and plundering, growing weary of the transient and perilous nature of their lifestyle. One day, the leader of the robbers had a thought. What if, instead of constantly moving and facing the risks, we settle in one of these lands? We could claim to be protectors, demand a share of the villagers' earnings, and live comfortably. Excited by this new idea, the band of robbers conquered a territory and proclaimed themselves rulers. They approached the villagers, not with visible weapons, but with promises of protection and order. We're here to safeguard you from dangers and chaos, they declared. Skeptical, yet weary of conflict, the villagers reluctantly accepted the robbers' rule. The robbers, now rulers, implemented laws and collected taxes, enjoying the steady flow of resources. As time passed, stories were spun and narratives crafted, portraying the rulers as benevolent guardians. The once clear memory of their origin as robbers faded, replaced by a tapestry of legitimacy and authority. And thus were born the first governments, masking the sword of conquest with a cloak of protection, shaping the decline of human civilization. Whoa, that's kind of uh, interesting, isn't it? Can you uh, kind of see how that could have happened? Could this story be more than just a story? Worth thinking about, I think. Let's talk now about the state. And it's it's basically a, a, a thing of force. It's a thing of, of violence, of initiated violence. And even when they're not using violence and holding a, a knife to somebody's throat. There's that implied threat of force. That's how the government gets things done. It is not eloquent, right? We know this. Imagine a man patting another man on the head, and they're standing on this grassy lawn. They're 20 feet from anybody else or any buildings or anything, and they're just all alone out there, and the one guy's patting the other guy on the head, and you're kind of thinking, well, that's interesting, but I guess they're just voluntarily doing that because that's what those guys like to do. And then if we think about it a little bit more and we zoom out on this picture we have in our minds, then we realize that there's a tower near the men. And inside that tower, through the window, there's a sniper sitting there. And the sniper is enforcing the rules through the threat of shooting somebody. They're enforcing the rules that their boss set up. That is perhaps every time two people meet in the grassy field, one of them should pat the other on the head. That is the hidden nature of the government, of the inherent violence that is in the government. 
Now, there's an excuse that government apologists make that if there wasn't this threat of violence or force, uh, that if people did the wrong thing and there wasn't some way that the government was going to send their goons to get you, then you wouldn't do the right thing. And this is presupposing that the government knows what the right thing is. We know that even if this was the benevolent desire of the government, that they, they really were always right about everything, they and their panels of experts, that even if that was all true and they were being benevolent and, and were just really well-intentioned about this, we know that they're not capable of it because it's a complex issue. And this takes us into this monopoly of power, this monopoly of force that the government has. And some people say, well, yeah, you have to have that. Uh, you, you have to have the, the one central authority that plans everything and then enforces it. But is it really necessary for society to organize itself that way? That do you and I, do we really need that third party to tell us what to do and steal our money and such? I, 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 don't, I don't think so. And, and one of my arguments, even if it was okay to do that, one of my big arguments is the complexity theory. The idea that in each of our lives, there are different values, subjective values, and I might like green and you might like yellow, and I might want to have a net worth of $10 million, and you might want to have a net worth of $50 million, and someone else doesn't even have the value of having some particular net worth. They just want to enjoy sitting by a stream, watching butterflies sing or listening to them sing, whatever butterflies do. We all have different values. Hundreds, thousands of different little nuanced desires uh, that we, we each have. And even if you just put a thousand people in the same area, trying to have one person plan everything for everybody, it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. It is impossible for governments and their committees to make this up for even a thousand people. Imagine seven billion or more people. It is absolutely impossible because of the complexity of the human condition for any group of people to think that they can do this at any level. Now, I will make an exception for tiny levels. Uh, if there's a, a small business, it can run smoothly with one person who says, hey, this is the way we're going. And, and it continues to work to medium-sized businesses and larger businesses. Of course, everything is voluntary. Anyone who works for them and decides to obey rules, they have to come and agree to these rules. Nothing wrong with having rules. Nothing wrong with having hierarchy. But it has to be voluntary. It can't be a coercive or a forced thing. It just doesn't work. Even when we ignore, if we, if we give governments the benefit of the doubt and we say, okay, we're going to say it's okay to be a collectivist, uh, utilitarian, kind of the, the Hitler, Mao, Pol Pot, uh, Stalin, uh, North Korean situation. It's okay to have that kind of mindset. Even if we said that that was okay, they're just not going to get it right. Think about all the governments who have starved hundreds of millions of their populations because of their policies. And they, were, they weren't trying to starve people. Now, in some cases, it was a punishment. But there are many accidental starvings that governments have caused, millions of them, hundreds of millions. They just can't get it right, even if they really, really want to. So we know that that's not going to work. Next, let's talk about this, this myth of authority, this, this idea that citizens need to obey. Uh, and, and people follow the state's rules, and, and then these rules go back and forth, but they always think that they have to obey. And this is explained really well, this phenomenon, in the book by Larkin Rose, uh, The Most Dangerous Superstition. And, and it's not really true, which is why he calls it a superstition. There is really nothing inherent in life that says that one person may rule over another. I may not rule over you. You may not rule over me. Now, when we say rule, this idea that there could be a, a way to do things without any rulers, I'm defining ruler as somebody who is telling you what to do that you haven't agreed for them to do that. So if I say to my boss or spouse or neighbor, hey, we're going, we're going to tackle this job together. Uh, will you run the show and kind of tell me what to do? We, we, I don't want too many chiefs and not enough Indians. I'm happy to be an Indian. You tell me what to do. You're the chief. If we say this, then I don't consider that person to be a ruler. I consider them to be a leader or, or 
somebody who is is helping get the thing done by organizing and, and having me do certain tasks and other people do certain tasks, as long as it's voluntary, that's okay. So when I talk about a ruler, talking about someone who does it, that doesn't have your permission every day, okay, I want you to rule me. I'm going to do what, do what you say. And I trust that even if I don't like it, it's going to be better for me in the long run and I'll do it. So there is that difference. In truth, in, in reality, do you really think you need somebody who you don't agree with all the time? Do you need to just give somebody blanket permission to tell you what to do? I don't think so. And you haven't. You haven't given anybody that permission. You might have thought you've given it to them, but you haven't. Let's talk about the ruling class and, and what their interests are. Um, the state often benefits a certain group of people. And it goes back and forth between helping those particular people. But each year, there are hundreds of new laws written. Do you think that 90% of them even benefit you and make your life better? Perhaps they're only benefiting the people making them the people who are friends of the people making the rules, people who are, oh, it's not called bribery. Uh, what's it called when uh, uh, not campaigning? There's some term when, when people give people who make rules money in order to have them make lobbying. Uh, yeah, lobbying. Do you think the lobbyists might be winning, but you're not? Even if you don't completely believe what I'm saying, have you ever been suspicious that the government and the people who are in bed with them are maybe at least leaning that that seesaw a little bit in their direction. Maybe not 100%, but 80 90% in their direction. How does the state fund itself? And we'll talk about central banks in a little bit. But how does the primary way that the state funds itself? Well, it's through taxation. And what is taxation? Taxation is it's a form of theft. It's an extortion. So under the, the umbrella of theft, there are extortions, robberies, burglaries, embezzlements. There are a lot of different kinds of theft. And taxation is not robbery because robbery is the taking of the property of another person uh, by using immediate force or fear. And if you just send a letter to somebody saying, hey, give me your money or I'm going to do nasty things to you, then that's not robbery. That becomes extortion. So Taxation is extortion. That's the form of theft that it is. And now there are people who will make arguments and say, well, I really like the things that come from the money being taken from people. And that stuff is really important to me and very necessary. So therefore, it's OK that that's done. But that would be like a rapist saying, oh, it's OK that I rape the woman. It's not really rape because I really wanted the good feeling that comes from it. So it's kind of OK because I really like the results of when I rape women. Are you kidding me? That is ridiculous. We have to be intellectually honest and say that a bad act like stealing or raping, it's a bad act. It doesn't matter how much some people might benefit from that act happening. It's still a bad act. Rather than saying stealing, though, most people prefer to use the term taxation. And so think about the example of someone who's whose uh, daughter commits suicide, they, the, she hangs herself. And then you talk to that person and they say, she passed away. Well, passed away is a much gentler, softer way of, of saying something without having those vivid, real, the truth of it, she killed herself. But that sounds so nasty. So we don't like to use that. And back in the days when I was a cop, uh, when somebody would hit a deer uh, on the road and it was injured, you knew it was going to limp around and die in a few days and suffer then as a police officer, I would go up and shoot the deer, and then I would get on the radio to, to let the dispatcher know that I was finished and leaving, and what I would say is, uh, the deer has been dispatched, I'm clear. I wouldn't say, I shot the deer in the head and saw blood go flying out of the other side of its head onto the pavement, but just to be sure, I put another bullet into its head. Well, that just sounds nasty and gross and disgusting. So I would just say, well, the deer has been dispatched. I wouldn't even accept responsibility. I dispatched the deer. No. In truth, I killed the deer. Now, I don't think that was wrong. I think that was a okay thing for me to do. However, you notice that I cloaked it in language that isn't, isn't offensive, that is, is gentler and softer. That's what the word taxation is. Well, you have to pay your taxes. Without that, how would we have? But that's going back to the argument of it's okay to do a bad thing if I really, really, really want the benefits that come from having done that bad thing. And, and we both know that that's morally 
not acceptable. So let's talk a little bit about probably the largest problem with government trying to uh, run the show. It's government's partnership with central banks. And the central bank in the United States, where I'm currently living, is the Federal Reserve. And the, the it was created by a, a cartel of, of big bankers. And they have a certain system set up, the way that they do things. And there's a great book about this, The Creature from Jekyll Island uh, by G. Edward Griffin. Well worth the read. It is very long, but well worth it. And I think Murray Rothbard also has something on central banking, a, a shorter book uh, that isn't quite as entertaining or as thorough as G. Edward Griffin's, but they're both great books. But long story short, there are a group of people who own a business. It's called the, the Central Bank. And then they team up with a government and they pretend that only the government can tell them what to do. But we know that it's really the people who control the money that are in control of everything. So central banks are really nasty. The seventh grade social studies will tell us, you know, the, the thing they know that kids will accept. And, and unfortunately, many people continue beyond that childhood stage and still believe it. And you go onto the Federal Reserve's website and they still, well, we're here to make sure that there aren't highs or lows and to even things out and make sure interest rates are set properly. And we just want to make sure the economy is okay. Well, no, they do some of that stuff too, but mainly it's just a way of, of stealing wealth from people. And it, it's, it's way too much to get into now. It's, it's many, many hours. Uh, so if you don't believe me and you're, and you're interested in knowing the truth about it, search it out. And maybe G. Edward Griffin is wrong. Murray, uh, maybe Murray Rothbard is wrong. Uh, but the Mises Institute which has lots of free audio files and videos you can download that talk about this kind of thing uh, at Mises.org. So it'd be worth checking them out if you're interested in probably one of the top three most important and dangerous things facing our future. I don't believe that it's global warming or climate change or the Russians or the Chinese or the illegals or Donald Trump. Uh, those are not the biggest things in my mind. I think Federal Reserve is right up there toward the top. So it's worth worth looking into central banking. Economic intervention. And, and we're winding up here, but we'll talk a little bit about economic intervention. The government does this in a number of ways. It does it through regulation. It tells people what they can produce, how much they can produce, uh, what kinds of things, it just give all the details about, about what it is and how it's done. There is licensing. There are taxation and tariff considerations. There are lots of ways that the state controls what happens in the economy. Uh, who can trade with whom? How much does the government get to peel off the top each time that happens? Steal off the top. Um, and so there are lots of ways that things aren't as, as they could be. And I'll just give a quick example of medical, the medical situation. I think everybody, probably to a person, would agree that the healthcare system in the United States, the, the medical system, is badly broken, very badly broken. It is ridiculous that things cost as much as they do, that it's impossible to get free market insurance at reasonable rates. I think my wife and I are currently paying about $1,000 a month right now because we've refused so far uh, to go with the, the government plan. So we're paying about $1,000 each. So 24 grand a year, a little bit under that, I think it is, every year for healthcare. And I think our deductible is $10,000. So the first $10,000 of junk that happens, we pay for uh, drugs are expensive. Even drugs that the government pays for the the pharmaceutical companies to uh, invent these drugs to come up with them, they'll they'll pay all those costs. But then the pharmaceutical industry still gets all these benefits later. It's not a free market thing. If Bill and Joe over in their their shed, they're chemists, and they want to come up with a a recipe to try something. I'd suggest you to be very that you be very careful about trying it. They might not know what they're doing, but if they persuade you and they say, "Hey, listen, I was a chemist for this many years. The other guy, I was a doctor, and this is kind of what we came up with. This is why we put it together. This is what we think it will do. We're not going to make any promises. You might take this, and it might kill you. Well, if I was a stage four cancer person, I just might say, you know what? It's worth it. I'll give it a go. Let's see if this helps. If it not, and it kills me, I'm waiving any uh, liability. You guys are giving it your best shot. Let's just do this thing. That's what could happen in a free market society where there wasn't the economic intervention of the government. 
medical costs would go down by 80% or more, probably 90 or 95% in a free market environment. No licensing, nothing like that. Now, I'm guessing you're probably thinking, but wait a minute, I don't want somebody just to go on YouTube and learn how to do a brain surgery and then give me a brain surgery. I, I agree. That's probably not the best training for a physician. So I would suggest that you not hire the person that only has those credentials. If it's important to you that they've been to Harvard and that they have worked at a major hospital that is accredited by some private organization who makes sure that doctors are good, great, go for that. If on the other hand, you have a splinter in your finger and you want to take it out and there's some neighborhood person who does that kind of stuff for 10 bucks, yeah, you might want to risk that and soak it in whiskey afterward and, and take your chances. It's probably better than leaving the splinter in and doing nothing because you don't want to go and spend $300 for an office visit to have it removed. Things could be much better. And I don't know exactly how. I don't claim to know. If I did know how things could be better, that would be a good argument for centralized control and that I be that central planner. I should be the grand pumba. I should be the king. I should be the emperor of the world, the president, the the whatever. But I, I don't know that. Nobody does. No group of people knows everything. We don't even know everything about narrow areas. I, I know more than most people about macroeconomics, especially the Austrian school of economics. But I certainly don't know it all. Murray Rothbard didn't know it all. Ludwig von Mises didn't know it all. Ron Paul sure didn't know it all. Nobody who has studied this or some other area, Marxism, Karl Marx didn't know it all. Joe Biden doesn't know it all. Well, that's obvious. Uh, nobody knows it all. And so that's a good argument that we shouldn't just trust somebody else to take over everything, uh, especially in important things like the economy. Let's talk about warfare and foreign policy. Most arguments that could be solved between people or businesses or other organizations could be just solved. We could figure out ways of, of solving them through arbitration or some other means. But when there are governments around, especially when the central bankers are offering them loans uh, to fight wars, then we get wars. We get, we get people starting wars. We get countries starting wars. Look at the deal. If there's an organization, there's this group of countries who hate Russia, they're scared of Russia, and basically they say, hey, let's all agree to be in the we hate Russia war group. Um, but rather than naming it that, they named it NATO. And there's this, so they're just very openly saying, we are not your friends. We're all going to band together and kill you if you raise a finger against us. And then imagine this group going and trying to get a member country that is right on the border of Russia to join this I hate Russia group. Obviously, Russia can't do that. That would be that would be moronic for Russia to say, oh, yeah, we want an enemy right at our doorsteps. Um, you know, that'd be like the, the United States saying, let's see, who's our worst enemy? Who are we most scared of? Somebody who's sworn to be our enemy and to join with others to fight against us. Let's have them come and set up camp right on the Canadian border, right on the border of the U.S., as close to our big cities as possible. Obviously, the U.S. wouldn't do that. Obviously, Russia is not going to let somebody do that. But because of this war uh, mongering that many politicians have, war is the health of the state was a great quote. Uh, we know from one of the most decorated Marines ever, ever uh, Smedley Butler, his book, War is a Racket, we know it's all a racket. Without governments, there wouldn't be big wars. Now, will there be somebody who arises, that's kind of, they're going to become a government, that's what the tool is that they're going to use, and will they perhaps go to innocent lands and try to take over those people? Yeah, absolutely. Bad people will always exist. I'm just suggesting that we don't legitimize them as government war chiefs. I'm just thinking that's a bad idea. What do you think? Is that a good idea? Now, I, I'm, I'm thinking if somebody, you know, Canada decides they want to uh, take over the United States of America and they get together, they're, they're building their armies and the United States of America, let's say, are no longer united. They're not states. If there aren't states, they can't be united. So let's just say there's no government in the United States. But word comes down, hey, that government up north of here is planning to come down to our landmass and kill a bunch of us and steal our stuff. Rip Torn. I can't kill America's neighbors. I can't. Canadian Bacon. From the director of Roger and Me. Yowza! 
All right, now, how did you know that was a nuclear facility? Well, they tricked us on that one. That's a hospital. But it's a hell of a strike. Do you not think that we would all chip in to keep that from happening? Look at GoFundMe. Look at some of the other crowdfunding options. Look at the old-fashioned spaghetti dinners. Look at the old-fashioned going to the really wealthy people and having large donations made. There are ways of doing this without stealing from people. Let's talk about propaganda a little bit. Why have we all believed what the government says for so long? Why are we falling for this? Well, it's because they've been very sophisticated about it, especially the last 100, 150 years. There, there's actually a great book, The Bernays Reader. Edward Bernays was kind of considered the father of propaganda or public relations. And that book will really open your eyes up and it'll make you see a lot of things around you when big companies are trying to pull one over on you or governments or it'll just, it's a very eye opening thing and worth looking at. If someone is really trying to sell you something, you have to wonder, you have to ask yourself, is this a thing that I want or need? Or do they just really, really, really want to sell it to me so that they can get what they want out of the deal? Now, maybe it is a mutually beneficial thing, but really pay attention when somebody's trying to force you to do something, make sure that it is mutually beneficial and don't believe everything, or I would even say anything that the government says. Now, maybe five or 10% of what they say is true and benevolent and good, but the vast majority is not. Let's talk about schooling now. Schooling is, and I'm not talking about education. Education is different. Schooling is a style of, of training people in a certain thing that I, I think of education as being more of a, a free and open, you're interested in something and you educate yourself about it. Schooling, this Prussian system of education that is in the United States currently, is a very bad system. It's designed to make factory workers. If you want to learn more about that, uh, read some John Taylor Gatto books or listen to his YouTube videos, uh, and it'll, it'll kind of enlighten you and, and give you a new perspective on the true purpose of schools. It is definitely not to take little individuals and turn them into intelligent, forward-thinking, uh, rational, hardworking, sophisticated, brilliant big individuals who can go out and create great value for the world. That is definitely not what schooling is about. Look into it some, and uh, that's, that's, well worth, that's well worth your time to do. Can you think of any ways that maybe we could educate our children and our young adults? And when I say we, I'm saying we could make suggestions to them. Is there any way that, that, that we as a society could do this better? There certainly is. Certainly is. This current system has just failed. Ideological support. How does the government get everybody to agree with them? Well, there are a lot of different areas of the world who have different opinions, and they kind of come down to collectivism versus individualism. An individualist society says that what is uh, what the individual wants or prefers is more important than what the, the big group around them wants. So an example would be, uh, I don't know, a gang rape. Uh, if there are 10 guys and they want to rape one woman, then the individualist would say, well, no, her individual preference not to be raped is more important than the group's desire to rape her. And the collectivist would say, well, it's not about her as an individual. She is just part of this bigger group, and what the bigger group wants is what should happen. And so, and there are a lot of other examples that that if someone goes out and creates a lot of value, uh, the individualist would say, well, that the individual did that, and they should reap the benefits. The collectivist would say, well, no, to each according to their needs, from each according to their ability. And so if this person had the ability to create great value, they should not get any better rewards than the person who created, I don't know, the, the janitor who's just 30 years of doing the same job and never even really doing it that well, they should both get paid the same. That's a difference in, in perspective. So how have governments gotten people to agree with them and think that they are, are wonderful and that they need to be there, that they need to be this intermediate person? Well, a lot of it is collectivism. A lot of it is the government saying, we need to get money from everybody and then redistribute it. And we, the government will do that. Uh, 
and, and some of the ways they do it, they get gov- uh, they get religion to go along with them. The Bible talks about obeying the the government and you know render unto Caesar what is due to Caesar. And and in Surah uh, Nisa four fifty nine, the Quran says, "O oh, you who have believed, obey Allah and obey the Messenger and those in authority among you. And if you disagree over anything, refer it to Allah." and the messenger, if you believe in Allah and the last day, this is the best way and the best result. So they're essentially saying, trust the government. Now, in Islam and in Christianity, the the there are places that say, well, yeah, but if there's ever a discrepancy between what the government says and what, what God says, we go with what God says. That they don't stand up, you know they don't stand up to that. I don't need to say that. Um, Let's talk about resistance and rebellion. What drives people to stand up for change when it's necessary? Wasn't wasn't there somebody, one of the founders of the United States uh, government, who said something about the the tree of liberty needs to be watered with the blood of tyrants from time to time, and and somebody else said there needs to be a war every generation, uh, or maybe not a war, but you need to get rid of the government and start over, uh, like a civil war or or just a peaceful change, uh, but any kind of overthrow. This needs to happen every generation in order to keep the government good, because otherwise governments are going to go bad. How can you resist? How can you rebel against this without doing anything that the the government doesn't want you to do? That's called doing something illegal. So none of us want to go to prison. None of us want to in, in instigate. Uh, we sure don't want to instigate something like the uh, January 6th uh, genocidal molestation. Now that, that was blown way out of proportion, but we see what neighbor what not neighboring um uh warring factions within politics will make up all kinds of fantastical names about this horrible thing that happened this protest that included some trespassing and property destruction uh that can be blown so out of proportion well i don't want that happening to me you don't want that happening to you so i'm not suggesting that you do anything that the government hasn't given you permission to do however we do have the ability to do certain things to resist to say, hey, maybe peace is better than government, and they are completely opposite. Maybe there's a way that we can have free market individualism. Maybe we can have a fair, honest, good society. There are ways that we can we can make steps toward that, don't you think? What do you think are some of those steps that don't involve stealing money from other people, uh, you know, taking money against their will, or telling them what to do against their will? Like, what can voluntarily be done? As a voluntarist, don't you want things to only be done that are voluntary, that that both parties agree with? Isn't that the better way of doing things? I think we can have voluntary associations. I think we can work things out. I don't have all the details, as I mentioned before. I don't know how to make all this happen. I trust, though, that all of us can. I trust that we can each individually make decisions, support the things we want to support, not support the things we don't want to, and we can make it all work out way better than it currently is. It won't be utopia. You got to be crazy. You got to be a pro-government person to think that utopia can be achieved through any societal organization. No, absolutely not. It's going to be imperfect. There are going to be bad people doing bad things. It's just how we deal with them and how we deal with each other, how we interact with each other. That's, that's, I, I think we can do better. Don't you think we can do better? So I'll leave you with that and just uh, encourage you to join me uh, and join uh, tens of thousands of other people who are out there producing content. And then behind them, people who are way smarter than content producers, the millions of people who want this voluntarist solution. And just to give you an idea of numbers, people who know the, the term voluntarist, those people are few. However, just about everyone, if you walk up to anyone who's just a good old country boy or gal or a a good hearted rabbi in New York or anybody, you walk up to them and you say, hey, do you think it's okay to take money from other people if they don't let you, if they, if they're not okay with it, they don't give you permission? No, that's wrong. Well, do you think it's okay for me to tell somebody what to do if they haven't agreed that I'm their boss? Well, no, you can't do that. That's wrong. All these things we've talked about, all these things you're thinking about. They have to be consensual. Consensual.